I want to welcome everybody to the Miami Jewish Film Festival, the world's largest uh, film festival of its kind. We want to thank all of our members, uh, sponsors, and community partners, all of you film lovers, and especially our presenting sponsors, the Center for the Advancement of Jewish Education and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support throughout all these years. My name is Rabbi Jonathan Fish from Temple of Judea here in Coral Gables, and I'm excited to be moderating this virtual conversation with director Michelle Shepard and producer Carolyn Abraham from the movie The Man Who Stole Einstein's Brain, which is premiering at this year's film festival. Thank you all so much for joining us. I was expressing with excitement with my mother, who's visiting from California, about this movie. And she reminded me in third grade, I too dressed up as Albert Einstein and presented <laughs> on E equals MC squared, which I don't remember what it is. And that's not <laughs> what the movie is actually about. It's about something just out of the box. You don't hear very often and I wanna get into it and I really wanna get into it. But before we do, uh, I'm hoping that each of you, uh, Michelle and Carolyn, you can tell us uh, where you are, and really how the two of you got together to create uh, this really important movie, this film that I had no idea uh, existed. Where is Einstein's brain? Okay, do you want me to go first? I'll start. Um, I'm, I'm, sure. We're both in Toronto. We're both based here in Toronto. Um, I was a, a journalist at the Toronto Star newspaper here for 22 years. I was a foreign correspondent. I covered nothing like this. I did national security. Um, terrorism, civil rights stories for many years. But I always knew Carolyn. She was at actually our competing paper, The Globe and Mail, uh, an incredible writer there. And I knew nothing about this story until Carolyn wrote a book on it. And that's almost 20 years ago. And um, we actually just got together a few years before this film and she was looking for advice on making a documentary on this. Um, and she had talked to other people about it and for 20 years had thought about bringing this, this story to, to the screen. I couldn't believe that it hadn't been done yet. And sort of in the process of giving her advice, I said, you know, if you, if you don't find anybody, I think this is not the type of film that I've ever made before, but it's so wild. Why don't we, why don't we work together? And Carolyn, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it was, uh, you know, serendipity in that, that way, because, um, Although I'd written the book 20 years ago, there was a certain urgency, I think, a few years ago where I realized a couple of things. One uh, is that, um, you know, I finally had a bit of sort of mental bandwidth between, you know, all the other things you do in a life to, to, um, to get to the point where you, you really want to sink your teeth into something new. And I'd left the newspaper and I was working on other books and things like that. And um, what was very plain to me was that Tom Harvey, who had been, you know, my original source, the original uh, reason I got involved in this story, uh, had had left the world and the brain had been passed on to somebody else. And I realized that person had now had the brain for 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. X. Um, and I realized that Dr. X was now looking for someone else to take over custody of the brain. And what Tom had clearly set in motion was this, you know, never ending story, this immortal afterlife of, um, you know, Einstein's brain, which on so many levels is ironic, because of course, you know, he was all about time and sort of its, its relevance and irrelevance uh, in the scope of, you know, the way uh, experiences unfold. And here was Ellie, oh, excuse me, I almost said his name. <laughs> um, oh, oh, I did say his name. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's it no more <laughs> um how he had managed to hold on to the brain um and yet was in the same position tom had been in when i first met him um so i felt like at some point someone down the line was going to wonder how on earth did this brain end up here so uh that was my sort of impetus for for getting going on it quickly and also the fact that the scientific interest in Einstein's brain had had really never waned. You you kind of took us through this story though, where we had in the very beginning of the film uh, a kind of a, a lack a lack of interest, a lot of things going on in the world. 
But towards the end, it kind of seemed that there was more interest. Science had picked up, new technologies were created. Do you think that there's more interest now? And do you hope that this movie is going to continue to spark that interest so there can be more study and more research in it? Um, well, I think I would, you know, from from the vantage point of, of research and, you know, trying to imagine how Einstein would have felt about this bizarre um, fate of his brain, I think that unless it is used in some way for research, what is the point of it? Um, you know, what is the point of keeping it? I think it would have... Um, you know, transgressed all of his wishes about what he didn't want, you know, nobody to worship at his bones. And uh, in a way, unless something is done scientifically to further study or further knowledge in some way, then that's what it is. It's, you know, an object of, of spectacle. Yeah. And I guess we don't really, I mean, the film kind of ends with with Dr. X. And as far as we know, at that time, when we did the interview with him, he wasn't sure what he was going to do with it. And we haven't heard in the, in the time since, since that he's made any kind of decision, which is, it's, it's interesting that it kind of, in a way it ended up as it did for Dr. Harvey, this, this almost a, a burden by the end, you know, a privilege to have been the protector for so long, but then what happens now? Can you, can you actually explain to me a little bit more? Cause there was something that uh, I, I was really drawn to. And that was, there was a moment uh, in, the, in the movie where this feeling came about, like he stole the brain, but it wasn't really stolen. It was kind of given over by a conservator, right? So there was some sort of um, expectation that someone would go on and continue doing research on the great Dr. Albert Einstein's brain, but there, there was a, a family issue. There was something was going on where we kind of felt like, at least as the viewer, like he stole it, but rewatching, he was he was given permission. It was told to, like in secrecy, like you need to keep this for as long as possible, for like for your life, basically. And he lived that, he kept that. Um, so is the title, uh, yeah. The Man Who Stole Einstein's Brain, like is that uh, the feeling that you think most people had, but now coming to looking at it, you know, years later or decades later, even like it wasn't really stolen. It was, it was promised to him and he kept that promise. I can speak briefly about the title and then Carolyn, if you want to, you know, people just saw yeah. the film, but explain a little more how, how it happened. Um, you know, we debated that title a lot um, because part of the reason that many of the people in the film spoke with us was because they really appreciated Carolyn and her book. Um, for many years that uh, Tom had become sort of this character of this villain who had stolen the brain. And that actually wasn't the case. I mean, as, as Carolyn can explain, you know, very quickly, he was given permission to do that. So we wanted to have a provocative title, but really the idea was that this is how he was known for so many years, but um, but then we're gonna you know dissect that and show how that wasn't. Oh, sorry, terrible pun with dissect. We'll show how that was. That was so un unintentional. Um, that we'll we'll show we'll show how that wasn't the case. But again, because of the sensitivities around that, we actually you know first had to make sure Carolyn was okay with the title, obviously, and decide on that together. And then we did ask the relatives, um, you know, his his son and his uh, stepdaughters to make sure that, you know, to explain that that's not what the film's about, but are you going to be okay with this title? And and in the end they were. And Carolyn, if you want to describe sort of what happened, it's kind of incredible in the day that after the autopsy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. Um, Michelle is, is absolutely right. I mean, it was a sense of, you know, uh, this is, you know, Tom's reputation and it's sort of like, here is this film that's actually going to sort of turn that, um, oh my gosh, the puns are going to keep coming, turn that on its head. Uh, <laughs> because of course, um, you know, he, he did steal it, I suppose, if, you know, in technical terms for 24 hours, but I think it was more of a case of, um, you know, I'd rather, you know, beg forgiveness than ask permission, 
or or um, if you want to be exceedingly charitable, is that you know in those days in morgues and pathology units, doctors did whatever they liked, um, and you know when um, I mean this we don't get into this in the film, but for example during that, that period uh, when Einstein's body was lying in the morgue, there were many other doctors who came in there and um, and in one case the uh, president of the hospital at that time gave his ophthalmologist permission to take um, Einstein's eyes, um, which, you know, are still around. Um, so, so there was a sense of everybody did whatever they thought, you know, they were entitled to do because they were doctors in a hospital and so therefore had carte blanche to do that. Um, the, the difficulty was that, you know, I, um, Tom Harvey ran into, you know, the, the story of the brain making it into the paper and then, you know, uh, the family becoming extremely upset, demanding it be returned. Um, and I would just say like a tiny thing about the permission that he did end up getting. I think, uh, you know, there was clearly, I mean, they had, a, there was a lot of tension between the executor of Einstein's estate and Einstein's family. But I think he really, uh, this is Otto Nathan, he really wanted to have, you know, uh, and some people said, you know, his devotion to Einstein justified by having science prove this brain was extraordinary and therefore, you know, Einstein was basically no ordinary mortal. Um, and so it was in his interest. But at the same time, he kind of hobbled Tom Harvey from the beginning because he wouldn't let him do anything publicly with that brain, you know, at one point, and of course, you can't get into every nitty gritty thing in, in a film that's, you know, an hour long, but at one point, like, uh, Tom tried to organize a study, like bring top researchers to Princeton to, you know, put up ideas. He put a small ad in the paper and Otto Nathan hit the roof and like, he, had to, he had to retract it. So it all became this sort of like crazy road trip stuff, like, oh, knock, knock, you know, any interest in the brain um, of Albert Einstein? So, yeah, that's how it ever happened. You know, I... I, I just love the different perspectives that were uh, shown throughout the film. Um, but I would love to know more about what was it like acquiring uh, these interviews or, you know, doing the research to get there and then how to put that into the film. So it flowed together in this beautiful kind of tale. Um, what was that? What was that like just acquiring the wealth of information needed to make this film and then bring it together? Well, we got a wonderful shortcut with a book. <laughs> so, I mean, it was it was unlike other films I've done before because it was, you know, all the research was really done already in, in Carolyn's book. And we used that as a roadmap. Um, and then, as I said earlier, convincing people to talk, it was difficult because people were kind of sick of this story and, and sick of Tom's legacy being tarnished and being, you know, kind of made fun of over the years. So we really had to convince them that this was, and you know, hopefully we did that. It was a different type of film, um, but in terms of putting it together, you know, we were we were really really fortunate that every character is a character. Like you know, because this is essentially the film is really um, just archive and interviews. I mean, it's one of those kind of documentaries that you're not you know, there's no present day action you're following. It's not you know, cinema verite where you don't know where it's going to go. We kind of could map it out ahead of time. But because they were all such wonderful characters, you know, just quirky and articulate and really passionate and had great stories that um, we were lucky that it, it worked out that way. And we had a terrific cinematographer, uh, Christian Beals, too, who just tried to, you know, be stylized as, as possible for each interview. So it had a kind of feel as well. And it and it took you kind of how many years to put that book, put the book together and feel confident in the research? Um, it uh, The book itself took two years um, from the time I think I first sort of encountered the story, which was weird. <laughs> uh, you know, just getting a, a phone call at the newspaper where I was at the Globe and Mail where I was working, um, you know, about an anatomical study. And you're thinking, wait, didn't Albert Einstein die like in 1955? <laughs> this is odd. Um, to to yeah, to completion was was two years, which um uh uh, you know, looking back, I didn't realize how lucky I was that so many people were still alive. 
um, at the time, because that's what we found out when we were, you know, trying to put the uh, the film list of inter potential interviewees together is, whoa, okay, gone, gone, gone. And, and then you also realize that, you know, the window in time to tell the story is closing very quickly, to tell it properly anyway. Um, and so um, uh, I think that the, the big uh, revelation uh, for me in, in doing the book, though, was, you know, Tom's very, uh, you know, quiet nature and not being forthcoming in defending himself in any way and having to find out sort of very close. I, in fact, I had the book half written when I found out I worked with a wonderful woman at the uh, Einstein archives at the Hebrew University, uh, Barbara Wolf. She was tremendous. And I was saying, you know, I'm looking through his files and I'm seeing these letters with the executor of Einstein's estate. And it seems like they had some kind of a relationship, which sort of made me wonder, how could they have a relationship if he stole the brain? <laughs> so, you know, you know, what was going on here? And, and you know, she she went and she dug into um, uh, Otto Nathan's correspondence. And then that's when it was sort of like, wow, there, you know, there were decades of letters and, and then that changed everything. And then I basically had to go back and, and re-interview. So it was, it was, a, but at that time, like I, Tom was alive. He was, uh, again, I think fortunate because he, he was, you know, in his early nineties and I think finally willing to say, okay, I don't have the brain anymore. And I'm, I'm willing to talk about my experience. To, to hold on to a treasure that, um, uh, you know, is talked about to this day, so many years and, and decades later, and will be continued because of this film and because of your book, right? It, it really opens up our our eyes to the the power of just, just the brain, which towards the end of the movie, it kind of alluded to that, you know, through the frontal lobe and all these other parts of the brain they, they're actually seeing and sensing so do you know is there is there continuous research going on like could there be a part two to uh the who stole the einstein's brain part do uh and talk about what what could come from this this research like what what's the what's the end goal how what where where is the brain do we know and uh how can we continue researching it um uh I'll answer. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the bulk of the brain is with Dr. X. Please bleep out all of the references to the name <laughs> that I made previously. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> the bulk of the brain is with Dr. X. And, um, uh, but, but pieces of, of Einstein's brain are quite literally all over the world. Right. Um, you know, they are, there are pieces, you know, scattered throughout the United States and and in Japan, and and we have quite a number of pieces here in Canada, um, and I I do believe research is continuing, um, and uh, I can't really say too much more than that right now, but um, there is research that's that's going on. Uh, what ultimately it will lead to, I think, will be. Um, you know, it yet in the telling. And, you know, there are a lot of people who think that, you know, in the end, Tom will be proven right that, you know, future methods or current methods to, you know, analyze, you know, the genetic structure and things like that will be more advanced. Um, and, and so be able to reveal things that they couldn't, you know, until now. I, I, again, I, having had the privilege to, to, to watch it twice, um, there's an image that stands out and I'd like to know an, a little bit more about the image that is, is really now ingrained here. And it's the image of Tom Harvey. Uh, it's the last scene. Uh, it's a photo of him and it, it's, I perceived it as it's in a jar. Uh, it, it, can you tell me about how, what came about as making that the final image, uh, of this, at least from what I remember, the final image of this, of this movie? Um, well, that was actually a cinematographer we started with, Ayer Singh, who um, we had a vision at the beginning and you just see it a little bit in the film. I confess it didn't work as well as we hoped it would, but we very much wanted Einstein's brain to be a character in the film itself. So to have his POV as much as we could. So I, it's very subtle. We'd hope to be a bit more obvious, but it was kind of hard to film. But you, you'll see like when there's the scene of the actual autopsy, the camera angle is from above, but from below rather. So it's the idea of it's, it's you know, Einstein looking out. 
up at the at uh, Dr. Harvey. And there's a couple other when he's being walked around. Um, we actually had a very cool jar that we <laughs> we like sawed off half of it so the camera could go inside. And then we've got some Im images like that. Um, so so the end scene was was supposed to be that, you know, this whole time Einstein has been in this jar. And yet because uh, Tom Harvey's life was kind of changed because of that. I mean, really, uh, the only constant he had throughout his life was the brain. I mean, he, you know, had three marriages, he moved cities, he changed his job. Um, so much in his life changed. And that was really one of the interesting things once we started interviewing people about Tom. It, you would have these interviews and it would almost be like you're, he, you're not talking about the same person. So he really went through these phases of his life, you know, from his 20s to his 30s to his 40s and upward. Um, but the way that, you know, his stepdaughters describe him is very different from how his son describes him. And I think that's, you know, that's just an interesting theme because that can relate to all of us. I mean, we all go through these very different phases throughout our life. But anyway, yeah, the idea of sort of, you know, that at the end of doing that was just that he was actually sort of captive to this brain as well, almost himself very physically in the jar. It, it, it is a, it's a really lasting image and it, it right. kind of brings it full circle of his studies and him. And now we're kind of studying what, what he went through in his life. Um, uh, thank you. And you had mentioned something earlier and, and I kind of want to uh, just dig into this. You said you had a lot of strange, uh, Carolyn, you said you had a lot of strange phone calls. Uh, a lot of people reached out <laughs> and, and now I'm sure some things didn't make uh, in, make the book or maybe it was in the book, but didn't make it into the uh, featured film. Can you tell me a little bit about what were some of those calls that you had to sift through uh, in order to make this all come to fruition? Yes. Um, well, the phone calls actually came after the book, because once I think what happened was, you know, uh, as as the book got out there, uh, it's like shaking the tree a bit and, you know, all sorts of odd things will fall out. So um probably the, the 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 two most peculiar calls or rather maybe the, the two most memorable calls were both from women and and one of them uh, was a woman who claimed to be um, uh, a girlfriend of Einstein's um, and you know she talked about how uh, he would not be impressed <laughs> this 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 would be very upset this whole thing would be very upsetting to him and um, you know she she had um, a European accent she didn't um, she didn't give me her location and it was uh, it was definitely a long distance call and so um uh it was very interesting though to hear you know somebody um talk about einstein in personal terms like that that was that was fascinating and then uh the other call came from a woman who had lived in otto nathan's apartment building in new york and, and you know she just you know sort of described him as this you know very odd odd fellow too, you know, kept to himself, never had the lights on in his apartment. Um, uh, and also, you know, uh, you know, dated occasionally, but was otherwise, you know, this very, very, you know, private, quiet man. And, um, you know, just, I, I think, you know, people who who ran across the brain in different ways, there was a, a student who had been in the class of one of Tom Harvey's uh, kids, for example, who remembered um, one of Tom Harvey's sons, talking about the brain for show and tell. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, and and then, you know, many, many uh, uh, letters and things like that that came in later after the fact, like, you know, schools and museums who would offered that, you know, to, to take some, take it all, you know, um, which, you know, I, I had a tiny sense of what Tom Harvey must have contended with every time his name and the brain appeared in the paper somewhere. So it was interesting. It, it, it is it's it's actually incredibly interesting and it was really well done and uh i i want to thank the two of you um uh, but before i i thank you formally and for everyone who's watched is there anything else that you'd like to to share uh or to uh leave us with something uh as we uh, as we begin to part ways well just thank you all for watching it uh yeah. we're, we're delighted to be in the festival um yeah amazing yes, definitely amazing. thank you much appreciated the the real the real thanks goes to to the two of you for um uh being here and really creating something that again 
in third grade, I thought I had mastered all of Albert Einstein. <laughs> boy, was, boy, was I wrong. And now to think that, you know, the sequel, his eyes, like, what are we learning about what he saw in this world? I, I'm going to hold my breath. Um, is it to director... Uh, Michelle Shepard and to our producer and and, uh, and writer, actually, uh, Caroline Ebram, who wrote the book uh, to uh, to get this ball rolling. A huge thank you for joining us. Once again, thank you to all of our members, sponsors, community partners and volunteers. And for all of you film lovers for participating in this year's Miami Jewish Film Festival. Thanks so much. <laughs>